All right, so I'm going to launch into the 27 profiles. So type one, um, habit of attention goes to improvement and wanting things to be better. We know the vice is anger. We know the virtue is serenity. So what does this look like? Um, the self-preservation subtype, the word they use is worry. And this is somebody who takes that habit of attention to improve and points it onto themselves. So this is somebody who is very, I mean, all ones are gonna have a harsh inner critic. This is someone who has a very harsh inner critic. They can really beat themselves up about a lot. This is someone who can also be very, very anxious. So they have a sense that maybe they're going to make a mistake and that is gonna be the thing that brings ruin to them, whatever ruin looks like. So they can be very sensitive to making mistakes. They can be very sensitive about blame. This is a type one that often gets confused for a type six because they over identify with the anxiety piece and they do have anxiety, but what's really driving it is this fear of making mistakes that is really all about this anger that the world is an imperfect place. So it kind of goes back to this anger about imperfection that then manifests as anxiety. So this is the self-preservation type one. The social type one, the word they use is non-adaptability. And this is a type one who takes that habit of attention to improve and points it out to the outside world, often to society or a, you know, groups of people that they can teach. So this is somebody who has, the word they use is non-adaptability. This is somebody who has a sense of there's one right way to do things. I know that way, and I will show you how it's done. So this is someone who has to be really careful that they don't take on an air of superiority. This is someone who can have a lot of difficulty kind of imagining that there could be multiple right ways of doing things. This is someone who can be very, very rigid in their thinking. Um, and these are people who often are teachers. They can find themselves in that role because the personality nav naturally navigates to this type of role. Again, the passion is anger, anger about imperfection, anger about imperfection out there in society. How is it going to get solved? I will show you how to do it better. And this is someone who can get very frustrated when they see things that aren't as good as they can be. This is someone who can be very, very idealistic. Um, the one-to-one -one type one, uh, the word they use is zeal. This is a hot type one. And this is a one that sometimes can get confused for a type eight because this is someone who actually can access anger pretty easily. This is someone who takes that habit of attention to correct and points it to their inner circle, the people they really care about. So this is someone who can get really frustrated that the people in their lives aren't behaving the way they want them to be. Sit up straighter, drink more water, da, da, da. like it can be this. Um, interestingly, it's coming from a place of love, but it doesn't always look like that. So this is somebody who can have that type eight look, accessing anger, being controlling. But if you peel back the layers, they're not interested in power. They want correction in a kind of small circle, usually their intimate circle. Um, this is the counter type. So in each of the three instincts, there is a counter type and I'll point them out each time. But the counter type in type one is the one-to-one -one type one. And this is the one that's often very hard to recognize as a one because it looks like a different type. It's not obvious that the passion is at play, um, but that's what's going on there. So then I'm going to move to type two. Type two, uh, the self-preservation type two, the word they use is privilege. And twos in general, their kind of way of operating in the world is I'm going to use relationships to get my needs met. So we talk about this as a person who's helpful and giving. It's interesting. You almost have to make an exception because the self-preservation type two might not be as helpful. They might not be as giving, but this is somebody who can have more of a childlike kind of presentation. And what they are doing that makes them a two is they're using relationships to get their needs met. So they almost have a sort of subconscious idea. I need to be taken care of. People take care of children. I will be behave in a childlike way, and that is how my needs will get met. Um, so this is someone who, again, this is the counter type. This is someone who can sometimes look like a seven. They could be playful. They can be high spirited. They can be more self-referencing than the other type twos. 
but they are using relationships to get their needs met. So they're not having the seven gluttony piece. They've got the two stuff going on. So this is what's happening there. And this is the, the counter type. The social type two, the word they use is ambition. And this is like the power to. So this is somebody who is highly aware of kind of power dynamics and they're being helpful in a strategic way. And often this is happening subconsciously. So it's not that the person is thinking, I'll help this person to get that. It's not that, but they're highly aware of kind of, you know, placement. Um, some, this is someone who's very tuned into social dynamics. This is somebody who may be very high up in a work environment. This is someone who doesn't mind being in the spotlight quite as much. Um, they tend to prefer to be the power behind the throne, but they might be the power behind the throne of the CEO. They want to be high up there, so they, they, they can have that. Um, again, this is someone who is looking to other relationships to get their needs met, so they're supporting important people, and that is what that is looking like. And then the one-to-one -one type two, the words they use are aggression, seduction. And this is sometimes described as the almost two adult type two. So this is someone who's doing all the two stuff of I'm going to get my needs met through relationships with other people. They're narrowing it down to, you know, close intimate relationships. So this might be the person who's got the spouse that they're kind of doing everything that the spouse would want because they know that the spouse is going to be the person who meets their needs. It can also be a parent. It could be whoever, but it's kind of this much smaller group of people. This is somebody who can be very seductive, uh, almost the two adults type two. And again, it's the same kind of using other people to get their needs met. So that's what's going on with the three twos. Just to keep in mind, the self-preservation two is the counter type. So then moving to type three, uh, the self-preservation type three, the word we use is security. So this is the humble type three. And if you're just reading kind of generic Enneagram books, a lot of times someone who's a three will not find themselves because this is the counter type again that doesn't look like a three. This is someone who wants success, who wants uh, you know, to be seen as a success in the eyes of other people, who's highly image conscious, but considers it bad manners to brag. So this is someone who's gonna be much more humble and understated. And this is also someone who's got a sense of, I don't just wanna win the award. I wanna make sure I really deserved it. So this can be someone who's extremely hardworking. They really wanna make sure they backed up whatever it was that was the success. They're not, the, they, all threes will cut corners. So it's not that they won't cut corners, but they wanna make sure they really deserved that award, that success, whatever it was. Um, these are people that can be highly, highly anxious. So sometimes they will over-identify as a six. And these are people, all threes have issues with, or potentially have issues around workaholism. This is kind of the extreme workaholic. This can be someone who almost can't feel secure enough. They just always feel like, uh, maybe I'm about to lose it all. So this is what's happening with this type three. And again, for threes, it's fraud to authenticity or vanity to hope. Uh, the social type three, this is the three that you're reading about in most Enneagram books. The word they use is prestige. This is the person who is just dazzling socially. This is the person who will openly brag. They will tell you their IQ, their title, their zip code, their car make and model, because they, it's important to them that you hear that because that is how they feel successful. These are the people who can be very chameleon-like. This is the person who can be the most competitive of the type three, someone who just wants to win all the time. Uh, and these tend to be people who are very successful and can often be very inspiring as well. So this is what's happening with the social type three. And then the one-to-one -one type three, the word we use is charisma. So this is a type three that wants success, that wants recognition, but they feel uncomfortable being under the spotlight themselves. So they redirect that kind of promotion to something or someone else. So this might be the manager of a famous, you know, entertainer. This might be the person who's kind of the head of the marketing department of a company. This is somebody who wants all of that success, is very tuned into image, but doesn't want it on themselves, redirects it to somebody else. This can be a more emotional type three, and this can be a three that sometimes has themes of melancholy and sadness. They can really have a sense that if I look inside, 
I'm not sure there's anything there. So I better not look inside, but that makes me pretty sad. So this can be what can be happening for the one-to-one -one type three. So then we'll move to type four. Um, the self-preservation type four, the words they use are reckless, dauntless, and you'll also hear the word tenacity. So this again is the, uh, the counter type. And just to say it, it, it's not, there's not a trend that self-preservation is the, always the counter type. That is not the case as you'll see later. But this in fact is the counter type this time. Uh, so this is the four that can be hard to identify. We call this the sunny four. So this is someone who has envy. And by that, I mean, they have a sense that everyone else is doing better than I am. Everyone else seems to be doing fine. Why am I not? And their kind of subconscious messaging is if I just work hard enough and put myself in enough difficult situations, if I suffer enough, that is how I will get what everybody else has. So this is someone who can be an extreme workaholic. This is someone who can put themselves in very dangerous situations. This is someone who can just play life very hard and on the edge with this idea if I suffer, that's how I'm gonna solve this envy that I have, this fact that I'm longing for something I don't have now. Um, this is somebody who a lot of these fours take, can take a while to identify themselves as it because they can be quite stoic emotionally. They can have a lot going on on the um, inside, but they aren't necessarily sharing that. And in fact, this is someone who can present very, very happy. So if they're reading a lot of Enneagram literature, they might read about kind of the social uh, four, which is more of a sad four and think like, that's not me. So you can be a four and be presenting very happy and be emotionally stoic and still be a four. And if that's what's happening for you, you may want to explore the self-preservation type four because that's what that profile looks like. Um, the social type four, the word they use is shame. This is someone who just has problems feeling good about themselves. They can have kind of a chronic inferiority complex. So this is somebody who's got envy, having a sense everyone else is always doing better than I am. This is someone who can kind of put themselves, you know, uh, you know, on a barometer, and they're always going to find themselves at the bottom. So this might be the person who goes through their, you know, university catalog to see how everyone's do doing and constantly focuses on everyone else's success, feeling like, wow, I'm not as good as these other people. Um, this is someone who can have deep, deep empathy. These are people who are very good at holding kind of emotional space for other people. Um, and this is someone who just, it's called the sad four, can kind of be a lot more open about the fact that they are not feeling happy. Um, so that can be kind of out there more in the social type four. And finally, for type four, the one-to-one -one type four, the word they use is competition. And this is said to be the angriest of the Enneagram types, even angrier than the type A. This is someone who externalizes their pain. So it's a sense of if I'm gonna suffer, so are you. So this is someone who can really be kind of a study in contrast. They can be very kind and high in empathy and sensitive one minute and then turn and be absolutely vicious. Because they are so sensitive, they can really hit where it hurts. There's a theory that Steve Jobs was probably uh, a one-to-one -one type four. And if you read his biography, he could be the nicest, kindest person one minute and on a dime be absolutely scathing. And so it kind of fits that. This again is someone who is um, externalizing their pain and it's described as the mad type four. So this is what that one looks like. And just to underscore the self-preservation for who is the counter type. Interestingly, you would think kind of with the word competition, the one-to-one the -one four would look like a three or would look like an eight. They can, but they're much more emotional than either of those two types. So it's this kind of extreme emotional reaction that would make it easy or to um, kind of identify as uh, a four and not a three and not an eight. Keep that in mind. We'll move to type five. Uh, so type five, from avarice to non-attachment, or from greed to generosity, uh, this is the growth path. So the self-preservation five, the word that we use is castle. This is the most remote of the type fives. This is somebody who really wants to minimize contact with others. They don't need much. They don't want much. They can have a very remote sense about them. They can often even live in remote locations. So a lot of times this is someone who just kind of wants that hermit life, wants to minimize uh, contact with other people. 
someone who typically has, you know, uh, pretty basic needs, they can be extremely wealthy and still live very frugally. They are not interested in the trappings of the material world. So they can stay very detached from that. The social type five, the word they use is totem. And by totem, it's this idea that things, something represents something else. So this is a type five that can actually be pretty extroverted and can be engaging with others, but they're doing it in a very specific way to gain knowledge. So this might be somebody who has decided they're interested in artificial intelligence and they're going to all of the artificial intelligence uh, conferences and they're making friends, but they're doing it in a way where the, the relationships are not about the relationship, they're about access to information, they are representing something. And so this is again a five that's very interested kind of in the cerebral world, maybe more engaged with the outside world, but in a very sort of focused way with a very clear intention to gain information, they are less aware and less interested in the actual relationship. Um, so this is what's happening with the social type five. And then finally, the one-to-one -one type five, the word they use is confidant, and this is the, the counter type. So by confidant, I do not mean confidential. It is this idea that they want one person that they will really bond with completely. And this is someone they will share everything with. So this is the most emotional of the type fives. This is someone that's actually having a very rich emotional world. They are not sharing that very much with other people. And while they feel it intensely, it's very hard for them to communicate that. This is somebody who kind of has an idealized vision of relationships and they can be really disappointed when people don't show up in the way that they hope for. So this is someone who puts a lot into these very narrowly focused relationships that are going to meet a lot of their needs and they have to be careful that they don't end up getting disappointed. So someone with a very rich emotional inner world. Um, so this is the type five. Beth? Of course, I have a question. <laughs> it's your type. First observation, I'm, I'm thinking about how I and others have described the types if they don't talk about the subtypes. When they describe a type, it's kind of a mixture of all of them. This makes it much more refined. And I didn't catch what the counter type was for type four. The counter type for type four is the self-preservation type four. Oh, okay, great. And Thank you. to your point, I, I just feel so strongly about the subtypes because I think there's so much mistyping going on if you don't know the subtypes. Um, you can, very much to your point, you're, you're, if you don't know, if you're not talking about the subtypes, you're talking about either one of the three subtypes or an amalgamation of the subtypes, both of which are not the complete picture. And you know, the Enneagram becomes useful when you find yourself. You know, if you haven't found yourself, it's interesting, but not that useful. When you find yourself, suddenly, wow, the light goes on. So I very much agree with you. And I just, you know, this book is not easy to read. It's thick, but I really encourage everybody. This is an excellent, excellent book. Um, start with my handout. I mean, that's a good place to get started, but there's so much within the subtypes and getting it right is key. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move to type six. So type six, you know, from fear to courage, this is the growth path that we're on. The self-preservation uh, type six, the word we use is warmth. And this is somebody who is very fearful, but presents very friendly. And what's happening here is this is someone who's got a sense of, if I make friends with everybody, then nobody will attack me. My friend, you know, if you're my friend, then you're not going to attack me. Probably you'll even protect me. So this is someone who can be very friendly, very engaging, but they're doing it from a place of anxiety. They have a sense that the world is a dangerous place, and this is a subconscious strategy to be taken care of. Um, so this is somebody who can look very warm, but if you scratch the surface, you'll start to see here just how anxious they actually are. Um, this is somebody who tends to have great difficulty making decisions for themselves. They just don't trust their own judgment. And so this is someone who will often have kind of a strong figure in their life. It could be a parent, it could be a boss, it could be a spouse, but somebody else who's making all the decisions for them and they're following along. If they have to make a decision, they're very uncomfortable with that most of the time, unless it's a self-preservation six who's done a lot of work on themselves. Um, so the word is warmth. Uh, the social type six, the word they use is duty. 
Um, so this is somebody who is looking for systems to feel safe. So again, the sense that the world is a dangerous place. The way I'm going to operate is I'm going to figure out what the rules are. I'm going to figure out what the systems are. I'm going to follow it. And that is how I'm going to be okay. So this is someone who's kind of scanning for like, what's the framework that I'll follow. These are people that have a very, very strong sense of duty. Often in a family dynamic, this would be the person that goes home to take care of the aging parents because they've got a sense, hey, this is my job. I, you know, I'm the one who needs to do this. Um, so this is an energetically cooler type six. And it's interesting, if you meet these sixes, they can present extremely polished and extremely calm. And you would have no idea the amount of anxiety going on in the background until you talk to them. And then they start to share. And then you start to realize, wow, this is someone who's really focused on what could go wrong. And there's actually a lot of anxiety driving the show. They may not present that way. So keep that in mind. And then the one-to-one -one type six, uh, this is the counter type. This is the, uh, the words that we use are strength and beauty. And even in the old Enneagram uh, descriptions, you would have heard about this. This was called the counterphobic six. And this is a six that sort of had this sense of, or sort of has this sense of the world's a dangerous place. I feel a lot of fear. The way I'm going to deal with it is I'm going to charge forward into that fear. So this might be the person who's afraid of heights and decides to go skydiving, who's afraid of swimming and signs up for a swimming race. Whatever it is that they're afraid of, they leap into it. But again, if you talk to them, there's a lot of anxiety. So this is somebody who is very, um, you know, whatever you say, they say the opposite. They're very contrarian. So if you say black, they say white. If you say yes, they say no. And when you talk to them about what's going on, they'll say, well, what it is, is I want to consider all sides of the situation. So I'm not even thinking about what's true. I'm just thinking, if you say yes, I have to say no, because we've already considered yes, and now we must consider the opposite. So this is someone who almost wants to look at every situation from a 360 degree view, and they do that by being contrarian. So this is the counter type, and it's the one-to-one -one type six. So all of them are moving from fear to courage. Type seven, uh, the self-preservation seven, the word we use is keeper of the castle. And I like to you know, underscore, it's the keeper of the castle. It's not the king or the queen of the castle. This is somebody who doesn't like hierarchy, but wants to be in the center of their group. So these are the ultimate networkers. These are the people who are really good at connecting people. This is the person you go to when you need anything because they are on friendly terms with everyone and they're very good at putting people together. These are people who are typically good at business. They can have an earthiness to them. They're more grounded than the other two sevens. This is the least commitment phobic of the sevens and they are not as commitment phobic because they look at relationships as a way to have even more experiences. So to them, being in a committed relationship means great. We can have a family, we can go on holidays, we'll do all these things together. And so for them, it's not intimidating. Uh, this is someone who's got to be careful that they're not transactional. So without meaning to be, this is someone who can be quite transactional in their relationships, kind of understanding, okay, you know, in our friend group, we need a chef. We don't have a chef. I'll make friends with a chef, you know, like that. And that can be what's going on. And again, it's subconscious, but this can be something that they have to be careful of. Um, the social type seven, this is the counter type. The word we use is sacrifice. This is the seven who knows what they want, but thinks, okay, for the greater good, I'm going to run against that instinct. So I know I want that last piece of cake, but I'm going to offer it to my friend. Um, so this is someone who can be very self-sacrificing. It can look like a two, but the key difference is a two won't be aware of their own needs. A seven is extremely aware that they wanted that cake. They just decide to give it up anyway. This is somebody who can be innocent. This is someone who can be idealistic. This is someone who has to be careful that they don't create a hierarchy of virtue with themselves at the top. So this is someone who can kind of have a sense of, I can manage my impulses, why can't you manage yours? Um, so they've got to watch that a little bit. Again, this is the counter type. And then the one-to-one -one type seven, the word we use is fascination and suggestibility. This is the least grounded of the type seven. So this is someone who truly thinks the world is way more awesome than it actually is. Their type structure embellishes reality so they don't have to deal with the negative. So they just kind of have stars in their eyes. 
This is somebody who genuinely sees things as better than they are. So they can be very suggestible in both directions. They can get other people to do things. They are excellent salespeople because they really believe whatever it is that they're kind of getting enthusiastic about. They can also be very naive. They're gullible. They can be easy to take advantage of because they have a huge blind spot in anything that could go wrong. They just don't see that. So this is the least grounded of the type sevens and their habit of attention really allows them to embellish reality. Um, to make it more positive. So that's what's happening. So for sevens, it's gluttony to sobriety or gluttony to discernment. It's where they start to narrow down their options and focus and not just be these kind of consuming machines. Beth, I see you have a question. Of course. Um, how much do the instincts of the wing influence the person? For example, I have a social seven friend I'm very close with, but he's got a big six wing. So how much does the six wing instincts influence him? It's a great question. So the theory in the Enneagram is that the instinct runs through the entire system. So for example, as a, I am a one-to-one uh, -one type seven, that means that I go to one-to-one -one type five, I go to one-to-one -one type one. It, it runs through the entire system. So it's not the case, or at least the theory does not suggest that it's the case that your friend is a social six with a self-preservation seven wing. That wouldn't be what's going on. It, he would have the, the instinct running through the system. How does that look? It depends on how strong his wing influence is. Um, and this is where I say, it's, it's very interesting. The wings aren't a thing, and I agree with that, but the wings certainly can flavor behavior. So if you've got a strong enough wing, you could adopt a lot of behaviors of that type wing, but you know your habit of attention isn't that habit of attention, it's just behaviors that you've adopted. So that's how I describe it. Did that answer your question? Extremely good. I've never heard anybody say that what your dominant instinct is, that'll be the dominant on your wing. So that's very, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got that from B. Chestnut. And it, again, I guess the thing I would want to share, I've been studying the Enneagram for almost 30 years because you can study it for, you know, like we are constantly, it is dynamic and we are constantly getting new information. I was just at the Nordic conference in, uh, in Stockholm and that was where I really had it brought home this idea that there's a there's always a repressed instinct. I, I didn't know that before. You know, I thought, had thought that it could be more even. So there's constantly kind of new information that we're uncovering. Um, it's dynamic, um, and so I would say just keep paying attention. But this is the theory, and to me, it, it makes sense. Like when I look at it, applying it to myself, because I'm very clear about my type and my instinct, it, it fits. Um, so, so um, what is the counter type on seven? Uh, the social type seven. Social, okay, got yeah. it, thank you. So then we move to type eight. Um, so the self-preservation type eight, the word they use is satisfaction. And this is the most direct of the type eights. This is someone who's got a sense of, I've got to go get what I want. And they've got a sense of immediacy. I better do it now. So I you know, joke, this is probably the person who sits down at the table and immediately starts flagging down the wait staff. You know, please bring us a menu, please. I would like my beverage. Um, this is someone who's just got a very, very direct personality. This is somebody who can um, have sort of basic needs. This is someone who is not so, again, with work they can be, but their emotional range can be more narrow. Um, so this is someone who has to be careful that they don't walk all over other people because they are just so direct and they're not necessarily tuning in to other people um, as easily. So this can be what's happening there. This is someone who can usually access anger pretty easily and pretty directly. The social type eight, this is the counter type. Uh, the word they use is solidarity. So this is the very much the counter type. And this is an eight that often has a hard time identifying themselves as eight. This is someone, you know, eights are from lust to innocence or from anger to surrender. This is somebody who doesn't feel anger quite as much, but they feel more protection. So this is somebody who it has a very, very protective personality. They're highly aware of who needs protection and they're often putting themselves in a role to be the protector. 
Um, this is somebody who can have a kind of ambivalent relationship with groups. And that happens because they have a sense I want to be in the group, but I'm probably about to be rejected by the group. So maybe I don't want to be in the group. So they can kind of be a little bit back and forth about that. All of that is stemming from a fear of rejection. Um, this is somebody who clear in their thinking, decisive, tough, um, but not expressing anger quite as openly and sometimes can even look a little bit like a two because they're so focused on kind of protecting others. Um, so this is the social type eight, solidarity is the word and it is the counter type. The one-to-one -one type eight, the word they use is possession. This is like the bad boy or the bad girl of the Enneagram, kind of the rebel. This is a very colorful person. This is someone who's kind of got a big charismatic personality, almost a sense that the party starts when I enter the room. This is somebody who thinks there are rules and then there are the rules that apply to me. Those are different. This is somebody very emotional. So the eights in general don't share their emotions that much. And the other two types of eights have a more narrow kind of emotional range. This is a very emotional eight. And when things are going well in their relationships, that's great. And when things are not going well in that, their relationships, this can be extremely painful for these eights because they are feeling quite a bit. Um, so that's the one-to-one the -one type eight. And finally, type nine. Um, so the self-preservation type nine, the word we use is appetite. This is the you know, habit of attention, goes to harmony, moves away from conflict. Their growth path is from sloth to right action. This is somebody who kind of has basic needs. They want good food. They want a comfortable environment. They want good company. They don't really need or want more than that. And often what's happened is they sort of have a sense, I'm not going to get it anyway. So I'm not going to shoot really high in terms of what I want. I'm going to keep it kind of you know, basic. Um, and I'm just going to get a lot of enjoyment out of that. This is somebody who can be more withdrawn. Um, so sometimes this is a person who might think that they're a type five. And this is someone who really kind of likes being home. <laughs> so this can be a homebody often. Um, the social type nine, uh, the word they use is participation. This is the counter type. This is someone who can look like a seven at moments. This is a much more gregarious, extroverted type nine. This is someone who's really working hard in support of the group, um, but they almost have a sense of, I don't know if I belong in this group, so I'm going to earn my place in the group by working really hard to support it. So this is someone who can kind of have insecurities of, I'm not sure if I belong or not, so I'm going to try hard. And it can be a, a giant misunderstanding because a lot of times if you ask the group members, they'll say that person is the heart and soul of the group. Of course they belong. But this is a nine who may not feel that way. Um, so this is someone who's got to be really careful that they don't constantly put the needs of the group above their own personal needs. That can happen very easily here. And then the one-to-one -one type nine, the word they use is fusion. This is a type nine that, I mean, nines fuse anyway, they merge. This is the super merger, the super fuser. So this is someone who is almost like looking for who do I plug into? Um, we had a panelist say like, I will become my partner. I will learn everything about them. I will adopt their mannerisms. I will just you know, completely become them. This is someone who has to really watch that they don't lose themselves. They can have a weak internal compass. They don't know who they are. Um, and being alone can be very threatening for one-to-one -one type nine. So that's something that they, it's actually good for them to be alone long enough to find kind of, you know, their own center, but that can feel pretty anxiety provoking. Um, so this is the, the fusion, the one-to-one -one type nine.